Yeah, three hours is a lot of time for one class. Yeah. Well, the, the last of the math class we were in, we started at 17.15, we got done at 20.15. Yeah, sometimes there's a few minutes after, we no problems, you know. I would never keep you after in a class like this. It doesn't make sense. We would stop and, you know, you did have time to go to that. Ch I can't believe it. Oh yeah. Oh, we're only four chapters behind right now. Yeah. So. Oh man. We got three weeks to pass on the four chapters. I'll, I'll, I'll try not to get. I'll try not to get us behind. I, we may not go over every instant of this book, but we'll. You know, hopefully we'll have scanned it all. Okay. Um, we're not going to wait any longer for everybody else, so they will catch up. All right. Any questions so far? I should say, what questions do you have? Teacher way to do it. By the way, I know one teacher trick. You know why when you're erasing the board, you should always erase up and down instead of side to side? Mm -hmm. no. There you go. Ah. When you go side to side, your butt jiggles. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. All right. Let's move on. Um, we're going to get into a little bit of this idea of forces. Okay, and forces, we already talked about forces in general. They're either when you push on something or when you pull on something. Gravity always pulls. It's a weird force. We've got other forces. Most other forces have an ability to push and pull, like electricity or magnetism. You can push things and pull things, um, but not gravity. But when we talk about the net force, and this word net simply means the total. Okay. We talk about net force. Um, we're talking about the total amount of force. So if you take a look at the book, right? If you take a look at the book and I put it on the table like that, okay? The book is just sitting there, but we know there's forces on it because we know that at least gravity is acting on it because it's on Earth. Okay, now it's sitting on the table, meaning that there's some other force also on it. Otherwise, if there was a force pulling on it, only gravity, the table wasn't there, would fall. Right? So there's got to be another force. In this case, where does that force come from? The table. Okay. Anybody know which direction it's pushing? Up. Okay. Not, not you know, rocket science or brains. What do they call it? Rocket surgery? There you go. Um, so yeah, so the, the book is sitting on the table. It's got a net force. The net force happens to be zero. How do we know that? Because it's not, well, careful. So Bobby said, oh, it's not moving. Good thought. Okay. Something that... Um, Something that uh, Tyler said earlier was actually, it's not doing what? You remember what you said way at the beginning when I was going to drop the book? It does what? Accelerate. Accelerates. There you go. He said it accelerates. It turns out, and we'll get to this a little bit later, if it's, it can be moving with a net force of zero. Remember the cannonball? If I tap the cannonball in the middle of outer space, no net force, or the net force is zero still moving. So that's a good idea, but you've got to be really careful about that. And that's one of those things, this is one of those concepts where I have to say a lot of people just get it wrong. They just don't really get it, but now you get it. So you're all, you know, pros at it at this point. Okay? All right. So that's what that is. Now, when we talk about net forces, these little guys, which we'll talk about earlier, we call them vectors. Okay? And vectors are just basically an arrow that points in some direction denoting whether or not something is, well, in this case, a force is in that direction. When we talk about the net force on an object, if there are two forces pulling in the same direction, okay, this is another one that's not rocket, rocket surgery, right? Two forces that are five newtons each pulling in the same direction, 10 newtons. It's just addition. Okay, it's, it's, that is pretty simple. Okay, if I have something pulling one way at five newtons and then something else pulling another way at five newtons, it's neutral, or the net force would be zero. zero, right? And you could practice that. If I had tug of war, right? That's exactly what tug of war is, right? Two people pulling against, you know, in different directions, and you end up pulling the equal amount, and you don't go anywhere, so there's no acceleration. Okay, zero net force. Okay, and if one is bigger in one direction and something else in the other direction, you just subtract them. Just subtract them. Okay, so very simple math in that case. Okay, now there is a slightly different case. 
what's the net force here? Sorry guys, we started a little started a little before you got back. You can catch up. Net always talked about so far, net force. It's the overall forces on an object. We're good. Actually, we'll give these guys a test since they came back late. Net force. You just learned it right now. So of course you read the chapter. Two forces in the same direction. What do they do? Five and five, what do you do to get ten? Add them together, right? It's five and five, ten. If they're in opposite directions, the net force is zero because they're not, they're canceling each other. And if one's bigger than the other, you just subtract them. So easy. Okay, good. All right. But this one, okay. What's the net force on this one? Ten because it's going in kind of the same direction. If I pull this way with five newtons, okay, and somebody else pulled this way, let's say it was right at the same exact point, five newtons, okay. What's that? That's what you might think, but it actually is a little bit more subtle than that, and we're not going to go into much detail about this, but we'll see this a little bit more often. What if I what if I redrew it like Let's see if I redo it like this. Five newtons and then five, well, make it the same, same length. Five newtons, okay? And what if I connected it like this? Does anyone remember how to do that one from math class? How much is that one? Nope, it's not, it's not, can't be five because isn't this a different, oops, isn't that a different distance than that and that, right? Well, 5 squared plus 5 squared, well, I should say a squared plus b squared equals c squared. C squared. This is just the Pythagorean theorem. If it's, if it's at right angles, so what you do is you actually do to get c. We're not going to go into it. This is the hardest math we'll do all year. 5 squared plus 5 squared, 25 plus 25 is 50, right? The square root of 50 equals c. Anyone know what the square root of 50 is roughly? No, close. You, somebody said seven, over here, seven. seven and something, right? It's a little, a little bit more than seven point something, right? Because it's a little bit more than seven. So, right, so this is actually seven newtons, roughly, right? So if you pull that way and that way, the net force is in this direction at about seven newtons, right? I'm not going to do much de more detail about that. If you want more detail, the appendix talks about more detail on how to do this stuff. Um, but it gets a little wacky when you think about, instead of at right angles, if you do like five newtons this way and then like six newtons this way, well, you have to figure out what the, you have to figure out what the equivalent vector is there. It takes a little bit more math. Okay, it involves trigonometry, which your eyes aren't supposed to have yet. I mean, you don't need it. You might have already taken it, but it involves some of that. But I just want to show you that things don't have to be in the same direction. Okay? And again, we won't go over any more details about that. But, okay. So that was the answer there. Pythagorean theorem. If you see one at the right angles, you do that. Maybe that might be a bonus type question on the test. You know? Maybe something like that. Okay. All right. Now we're going to talk about this cool thing called a support force. Okay? Otherwise called the normal force. Why is it called normal? Well, it's not because there's abnormal forces. It's because that just happens to also mean perpendicular. Okay? So the support force on a book, if you've got gravity pulling down in the book and the table is nice and flat, support force is perpendicular to the table. In other words, at a right angle to the table and it's going in the opposite direction. That's what's called the support force. So when we look at the book on the table here and we say, what's the support, what's the support force? Well, it's the table pushing up on the book. Okay, does that make sense? That's what the support force is? Okay. It's kind of like when you push down on a spring. You can actually feel it. You can feel the pushing down on a spring. Support forces don't necessarily have to be up and down. If I push the book against the table or against the wall, which direction would the support force be on the book from the wall? Out, oh, right? In fact, I'm putting another support, another normal force towards the wall. Okay? And by the way, we'll get to this a little bit later. The only reason the the only reason the uh, book stays up there? 
No, not, not quite Newton's first law, but it's, it has to do with the friction of the wall. If this was ice, you know how hard it would be for me to hold this just with my finger pushing that way? I can actually push down a little bit on it and still get it, it hurts. But still push, I can push down on it, but if there's enough friction on the wall to keep it from going. We'll get to friction in a little bit. Okay, so anyway, very similar here. And by the way, this is, the, this is kind of a cool part about this whole support force thing. The only reason the, the table is able to push on the book is because there's like actual matter here and, elect and atoms that are kind of pushing against each other. If you really want to blow your mind, the atoms never actually touch each other. So you're not actually ever touching anything. If you're standing on the ground, you're actually hovering a little bit above the ground because those atoms are really close to each other. They're not actually, there's no such thing as like touching. It's, it's all very bizarre, like electron clouds and things. And it's, it's kind of cool, but yeah, Tom. It, it's like with the hockey puck, it's not actually mm -hmm. on ice. There you go. Exactly. Lots that's of yeah. And yeah that's that's a, that's exactly right. But it's even more than that. It's even more than that, though. It's it's not even on the water. It's like a little bit above the water. Anyway, just to blow your mind a little bit. But that's what's going on here. But it's all about like the the atoms kind of pushing against each other, versus using a totally different kind of force, electric force, incidentally. Okay. So you see the support force all the time when you deal with a scale, a bathroom scale, or a scale at the gym, right? The scale actually doesn't really read your force on it. Well, I guess it kind of does. It kind of it reads the support force of the floor, actually. It depends on which, like, it depends on how the mechanism is in there, okay? But in this case, we know that if you're standing on a scale, gravity's pulling down on you, right? The floor is pushing up on the scale, the floor is also pushing up on you, and you're pushing down on the scale. Maybe I said that twice. But anyway, the point is that the, you're pushing down on the, on the scale with the same amount of force that the, almost, that the uh, support, that the scale is pushing up on you. Okay? So it's kind of cool. Now here's an interesting question. You guys have all been in an elevator before. You know how you get that weird pit, like, feeling in your stomach when the elevator goes, starts and stops? By the way, anybody been on the elevator at like the Empire State Building or the Sears Tower, or some of these giant buildings? Go to like Malaysia and there's this like, you know, just shoots you right to the top. You only really feel that weird feeling right at the beginning and right at the end when you've got those. You're gonna be the you're gonna be acceleration you're gonna be acceleration guy for the whole class. When it, when you do it, no no I, I promise you won't be. Um, when you when you're accelerating and you're speeding up or slowing down, but. Think about this. Okay, worst case scenario. You're standing on, you're weighing yourself in the elevator, as you do. Okay, weighing yourself in the elevator, and all of a sudden somebody snips the elevator and it goes flying to the ground. Okay, what, what would the scale reading be? No, you won't, you won't fly off of it. You might hover a little bit, but you wouldn't fly off of it. You get a huge pit in your stomach, and you go, oh my gosh, you know you're falling because of that, but the scale reading would be what? Zero. Okay. Why? Because there's no, there's no, like you're actually falling at the same rate as everything else. There's no way for the floor to push back up on you. It's not being held up by anything to push back up on you. It's got to be something. I mean, the table pushes up in the book, but what's the table? How's the table staying where it is? Well, the ground is pushing up on it, or the floor is pushing up on it. The floor stays where it is because the ground is pushing up on it, and the ground is part of the earth, which is where the gravity's coming from to begin with. So, all related like that. Okay, but anyway, yes, if you're standing in an elevator, weighing yourself, cut the cord, you hopefully remember the weight because you'll never see another, you'll never see it again. Miracle life. <clears throat> okay, all right. Now we've got to talk about this idea called dynamic equilibrium. Two kind of big words. <laughs> dynamic meaning moving, <clears throat> equilibrium meaning no net force. Okay, and this is what Bobby was kind of alluding to earlier. When, the puck, when you do a puck and you ice the puck all the way down to the other end of the ice rink, okay, no force is acting on it. How does it move? Or no net force, I should say. No horizontal forces anyway. Net force is zero. It's in motion because of this whole thing of inertia. If you push a chair across the room at constant speed, in other words, it doesn't slow down, speed up or slow down. Okay, what's the net force on it there? If it's not speeding up or slowing down, what do you think the net force is? 
always zero. Okay? If things are not speeding up, this is one of those concepts. It's like, did you ever hear about like college professors like stomp their foot when they're telling you something important that they're gonna ask you on the test? That's not really the way I work, but if I were to stomp my foot, it would be to tell you that if an object is at constant speed, it has no net force. Why? Because if there was an a force, if the forces were some value, it would be accelerating, which we'll get to in a little bit. Okay. So therefore, and this is coming up in a little in, a, in another slide or two, if I'm pushing the chair across the table across the floor, if I stop pushing, it stops. If I keep pushing, I have to keep pushing to keep it going. Meaning that if I'm pushing in one direction, there's got to be a force in the other direction. Remember, because it's a net force. This is the chair. That's the chair, and I'm pushing this way with, say, 10 newtons, and it's not, it has no net force. How much force needs to be in this way? Same amount, 10 newtons. What's causing that 10 newtons? Another Don't force. say air resistance. Another force. Which is actually what type of force? Opposing. Not a support force, because the support force is up and down. It's opposing, but what's causing it? And you'll hear it. What's causing the noise? What is it? Friction, right? So that's the other force that we're going to talk about. Okay? And, ah, next slide. Perfect. Force of friction. Friction is a weird thing. Okay, we're going to talk about friction, but we're not going to go into so much detail. In fact, I don't even understand exactly what happens with, with friction. But it's, 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 we can do, we can think about it and get the basic ideas. Friction is the resistive force that opposes motion of an object past another with which it is in contact. Friction always acts in a direction to oppose motion. Okay, what does that mean? Two objects are touching each other. You're trying to rub one against the other. That's where the friction comes from. Okay, and if you all did this, right, you'd notice that they've got friction, and that's where it actually warms up, and it's whatever. Again, it's because those atoms are like banging into each other, okay, and that's what's going on. So I, if you slide your hands across each other, you got this force of friction, okay, which is opposing the direction you're trying to move something. You guys have all heard of perpetual motion machines? I don't know if you've ever heard of that. People try to do this all the time. They try to make some machine that they start it and it keeps going and actually produces energy and it does that forever. Or even if it doesn't produce energy, it keeps going forever. That's yeah. They make watches like that. Well, so, well, okay. So my watch is kind of like that. It's, I don't have to wind it. If I keep wearing it every day, I don't have to wind it. It's not perpetual motion because where's the motion coming from? Oh. It's coming from my breakfast because I eat. I turns into energy and I walk down around all day and there's a little mechanism in there that actually goes back and forth because I'm swinging my hand around. So yeah, so it's, it, it's co they're called perpetual motion watches because you, know, you don't have to wind them, but really the energy's coming from somewhere. So yeah, but good, good call. Yeah, Tom? There's a pendulum in the uh, Oregon, in the Holding Convention Center uh -huh. that it's been going since they- Since they opened it? it. Yeah. And they don't ever do it, start it over? They don't ever have to, very, I, they, they might. In theory, they may never have to do it, but it's yeah. been moving. I, I don't know. It's yeah. been there for 10 or 15 years now. I bet they pay some guy at night to go on. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, but it, that's probably because they've minimized as much friction as possible. They've gone all the way to the top where it's hanging there, and like, and they put lots of oil on it and yeah, lubrication the way they on it. it with the yeah. Way the earth moves yeah. And yeah. Like that. Well, that could be true too. I mean, they might be somehow harnessing. Well, it would be hard to like somehow harness the. Or if, I don't know, you could have a little windmill hidden somewhere. I'll have to look, it up. look it up. Let me know. Okay, so if you push on a chair to the right, friction acts to the left. Makes sense, right? I guess you're right, left, right? Okay, so an object falls through the air. We already talked about that. Friction is pushing up on it. Okay? Here's near a weird one. You guys know conveyor belts, right? You go to the store and you put your stuff on a conveyor belt. Okay, and your stuff goes, and let's say the conveyor belt's going this way, down there in the swing right, right? Which way is the friction going? Against the way that, well, the conveyor belt's moving this way. And the friction, if it was frictionless, what would the thing do? Actually, so this is a conveyor belt, right? This is, a, this is like going back and forth, right? Let's say it was, let's say they made a, somehow made a conveyor belt out of oil or ice or something and it was perfectly frictionless. 
and you put your box on there, the conveyor belt would just go, and the box would just sit there, right? So there'd be no friction, right? All of a sudden, the friction is what makes your box go to the cashier over here, right? Because the friction actually is what's actually making it go this way. Just something to think about. You'd think that it, you know, we say friction always acts in a direction to oppose motion. Well, it's kind of that the box wants to stay where it is, so the motion is like not existent. It's, it's a little odd, but it's more in the accelerations. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that one in because that's a weird one. Conveyor belts are always kind of weird, and, and it's why I don't necessarily agree that this is the case. Always. Sometimes it doesn't seem to. Okay, so that's friction. In fact, there's a little worksheet I put on your desk here, and, and I thought about it. This might be, I might let you do some of this for homework if we get to all this stuff, but um, let's do this together right now. Okay, so take a look at this sheet, and it says, everybody have one? I think I gave one to everybody. This one? Just the front page. A crate filled with delicious junk food. It's like somebody got at the, like those. Look at those beef jerky. Mm. All right. A uh, crate filled with delicious junk food rests on a horizontal floor. Only gravity and the support force of the floor act on it as shown by the vectors for the weight and the normal force. Okay. So we've got the weight and we've got the normal force. Okay. What is the net force if it's just sitting there? Zero, circle zero. Okay, how do we know? It's not accelerating. There we go. You can say it's not moving, but that's not quite correct. Okay, it's not accelerating. Okay, now you start pulling on it a little bit, just with a tiny little pull. Okay, if it's not accelerating, there must be something stopping. Now I can do that, right? I can I can pull on the chair, and ha I'm actually pulling here, and it's not moving, right? Well, if it's not moving and I'm pulling, and there's net force, I am applying a force. I'm pulling it. If I tied a string to it and started pulling, it wouldn't move quite yet, right? You're applying less force than the friction. Ah, well, careful. If I was applying less force than the friction, that means the friction would be more, and wouldn't it go the other way? That would be weird. OK, that would be, if I pulled this way and all of a sudden it jumped that way, we'd all kind of be a little weirded out by that, right? Well, what's going on is there's a little frictional force here, which kind of matches. It, in fact, exactly matches the amount you pull until it starts moving. So let's see. A, uh, a force of friction acts which is less than, equal to, or greater than the P. If it's not moving, these two have to be equal. equal. Careful, because if we said greater than, it would be the exact same thing that Tom said. He said it would go the other way, and that would be weird. So it's equal. Okay. The net force on the crate, is it accelerating? I'm just pulling it. I'm pulling, but it's not going anywhere. So the net force is still zero. OK, number three. Pull P is increased until it starts to move. So now it's starting to move, OK? And it's pulled so that it moves with a constant velocity, which we'll get to what that means in a little bit, but it means it's going the same speed, OK? If it's the same speed, it's not accelerating. Therefore, what's the net force? Constant velocity means the acceleration is, sorry, Friction F is what? If it's the same, if not accelerating, friction is Let's see. If it's not accelerating, that would mean if friction was greater than, it would go in the opposite direction. It'd be weird. It wouldn't do that. If friction is less than, it would be speeding up. So it's got to be equal to. It's actually, well, it's greater than zero. Is it the answer? No. Greater than P. It's equal to P is what the answer is. Okay. All right. Frick, sorry, three, number 3A, three friction F is equal to because it's going at a constant speed. Okay. All right, let's try the next one. B, constant velocity means the acceleration is zero. We'll get to that in a little. Actually, I think we did this a little early because we haven't gotten to what all those terms mean. And the net force on the crate is. If it's not accelerating, it's got to be, the net force has to be zero. Okay. All right, I tell you what, tell you what, let's do this. Let's, let's pause on this one. We'll get to this one. Maybe we'll come back to this one right at the end. Okay, I just wanted to, I, I, there's a couple terms in here. We don't want to, don't want to overdo it with terms we haven't talked about yet. Okay, ah, checkpoint. So these are in your book, by the way, these checkpoints. You should try to look at them. Again, sometimes a lot of words, but 
This one's not too bad. Suppose 50 Newton force. We know Newtons are forces. 50 Newton force, horizontal. You know the difference between horizontal and vertical, right? Okay. Horizontal force on a heavy desk, pushing on a heavy desk like this one, right? I'm pushing on it, and it's motionless. The fact that it remains at rest indicates that 50 Newtons isn't enough to make it move. I'd have to be stronger, right? Push harder. How does the force of friction between the desk and the floor compare with your push? Again, I'm pushing, and it's not going anywhere. It's not accelerating. What's the friction have to be? There we go. It's got to be 50 Newtons, right? It sounds like you might want to say, oh, it's got to be zero. If the friction was zero, you move. Because it has to be yeah. what you were saying earlier, that they have to be equal. Exactly. So I've got a, I've, I'm pushing on the table this way. Friction's got to be, if it's not moving, friction matches the amount of push. And it gets bigger. Friction actually changes as you push harder. And then eventually you push hard enough, and it starts to move. Different story. OK, ah, here we go. Aha. You push harder, 55 Newtons, and the desk still doesn't slide. How much friction? 55. Ah, 55. Because you're just pushing, now there's five more, if you will, but it's still 55. Everybody get that? This is, it's, this is what we should just pause for a second and see if everybody gets it. Some people just, oh, I got it. Other people may not get it. Question or no? Yeah. More. Oh, it still hasn't moved, right? It says you push harder and the desk still doesn't slide. Right? So if the desk still doesn't slide, we're just pushing harder. Because I can push a little bit and it doesn't move. And then I push a little harder, it still doesn't move, and a little harder, and my amount my push is going up, up, up. If it goes from fifty to fifty-five, but still doesn't move, friction's gotta go up to fifty-five too. Everybody get that one? I don't want to. I don't want to go too fast because I don't want to. I mean, it, it, if you find yourself in this class saying I didn't get that, that's fine. Either ask a question about it, number one, or number two, write it down and say I got to go revisit that, or three, ask me later or email me or whatever. Don't worry about asking a question. It takes time to get these things down. Okay, now <clears throat> you push harder and the desk does move. Once it's in motion. You push it at 60 Newtons, which is just enough to keep it sliding at a constant velocity, which we'll talk about what that means in a bit. How much friction is now on there? If it's 60 and constant motion, 60 Newtons of friction. Constant, no, okay, we got that now. We're getting that idea. Constant means same, same, zero, accelerate, zero, net force, etc. What happens? If you slide the desk, when you exert a force of 65 Newtons and the friction is only 60. In other words, you're pushing this way, six, this way, 65. Friction is now only 60. What's the net force? Five Newtons. Five Newtons. Which direction? Uh, to the left. Five Newtons to the left. If that's the net force, what happens? It accelerates. It accelerates. OK, good. We got that. All right, so we're getting there. Getting there. OK. Now, we are now going to talk about speed and velocity. OK? Now, again, this is like we're going through a lot of stuff here. So I, I guess I don't like the fact we have to go through so much, but it's just kind of we've got to change, change, change speeds oh, a little bit. OK? Speed is pretty easy. You guys all know about speed, you've probably seen the movie. Right? You, you've probably not done the drug, I hope. Okay. Speed is simply the amount you go divided by how long it took. Okay. And what that means is if I go 10 meters, that's a distance, right? 10 meters in one second, my speed was 10 meters per second. If you go 10 miles in a car, it takes you one hour. How fast are you going? Faster than you can drive a gator out here yes. legally, right? Anybody got pulled over yet? Like yeah. Dead. What did they say? Are they like, sorry, you're going eight miles they said an hour? They me. At what? Not 15. In the truck or a gator? It was in a gator, and I said, did you look at it? Because it's all pieced together with different gator pieces. Well. Because high speed pursuit. It was, but I didn't get a ticket. They gave you a ticket? How much was it? Down one foot. You have 
didn't cost anything. Had to get a, like a once off. You know? All right. Well, anyway, if you drive 20 kilometers in one hour, you're traveling at 20 kilometers per hour. We get that. We've all talked about that our whole life, right? We've even gotten pulled over for it, right? If you drive 20 kilometers in 30 minutes, different unit of time here. Hmm. Okay. First, we were talking about hours. Now we're talking minutes. You're actually going 20 kilometers in 30 minutes. And if you divide 20 by 30, 2 divided by 3 happens to be 0.67, you'd go 0.67 kilometers per minute, which is actually, you know, that's not too bad. That's moving. Or 20 how much how many hours is 30 minutes? Half an hour. So you're going 20 divided by one half. 20 divided by one half. Anybody? Fractions are terrible. People always forget fractions. 20 divided by a half gives you what? 30. What's that? 30, nope. 10? Nope. 25. How about, somebody said it. 40. Because remember you flip it over and you multiply the 2 times the 20? Either easier way, if I just said this, 20 divided by 0.5, you probably would have gone, oh yeah, it's at 40. Well, whatever. Don't worry about that. But, it's, but the point is that if you're going 20 kilometers in 30 minutes, you're going 20 kilometers in one half of an hour, or you're going 40 kilometers per hour. Okay? Is there a difference? So let me, let me peek the next slide. No, we'll get there in a minute. The speed at any instant is called your instantaneous speed. Not very hard. They added a little anus on the back of the instant, right? Okay. If you're in your car, you see the instantaneous speed on your speedometer. Unless you're in a gator, in which case you can't. Okay. Or it was pieced together with a gator. With a, with a, yeah. um, if you're in a car, you look at the speedometer. That gives you instantaneous speed. Okay. The average speed is totally different. Well, it's actually not totally different in our terms of speed. It's just the total distance divided by the amount you're moving. And what that means is you, okay, you're sitting at home and you're going in the, the little like school zone and you're going 20 miles per hour, right? And then you get on the highway and you're going 60 miles per hour or 80 miles per hour. And then you get off and there's like traffic, so you're going like two miles an hour. Add all those distances up, divide by the total time, it just gives you your average speed. So far so good? Makes sense, everybody? Average speed? Okay, that's the average speed. Rearranging the average speed, now this is back to your algebra. Now I know you guys took some algebra because you're supposed to before you got here. If we do average speed, we'll call this average speed. That means average, by the way, a little V with a bar over it. Actually, we'll do it this way. Call it speed for now. Speed with a little bar means average, okay? Equals total distance, we'll call that D, divided by total time, we'll call that T. How do I rearrange that to get D by itself? You guys remember that? Multiply yep, multiply both sides by T, right? And you get the distance equals the speed times the time. I'm just using a little dot for time. Distance is speed times time, which makes sense, right? If I'm going 60 miles per hour for one hour, how much, how much uh, distance did I go? 60 miles per hour for a whole hour. How much distance? 60 miles. Okay. 60 miles, right? Would you do hours or would you do minutes? Or does it matter? It's up to you. Totally up to you. Although if you're going to do, you want to do something that people, uh, you know, would maybe understand. Okay. Hey, Eric, don't fall asleep. Stand up if you have to. Okay. So anyway, that's the, the, the distance. We're going to use this a little later when we try to, when we figure something, when we do a little uh, something. Uh, actually, you know what? Here, I'll show you this. If I can. Whoops, that's not it. Let me see. Question is, where did I put this? Uh, da, 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 da. Here we go. Uh, actually, where did I put this? Hold on. Put it in. Interactive video videos. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay, um, here's what I want. There we go. Okay, uh, let's see. I need to make this smaller, but a little bigger so you can see it. Okay, here's a little question for you. Okay, okay. all right. Can everyone see that? 
Okay, you ready for this average speed? <clears throat> These bikes are going towards each other at 10 kilometers per hour. Okay? There's a little B in here. And the B begins going from this guy, and he's flying along. When he gets to this wheel, he goes, uh-oh, turns right around and goes back this way. And now this guy's a little closer, right? Because he's moved a little bit. And then the B turns around and goes this way. And then he turns around and turns around and turns around. But these guys are going towards each other. And then all of a sudden at the end, the B goes, whoop, squish. How many kilometers did the B travel total? This is like one of those puzzles. First, so, okay, there's 20 kilometers here. And the B starts here, and he goes here. Does he go a full 20 kilometers? No, because she's moved a little bit. So it's a little less than 20, so it's maybe like 19.5. And then he comes back. Does he go 19.5 again? No, nah, he goes maybe like 18, right? And then he goes back this way, and then this way, and this way, and this way. Do you want to add all those little numbers up? No, you don't want to do that, right? I wouldn't even make you do that in math class. Maybe calculus class. It's a calculus problem, right? We do not have to use calculus for this problem. Anybody take calculus? Yeah? We do not have to use calculus for this problem, right? What do we know? We know, right? We know the total amount of distance that the, between the two, right? Okay? Do we know how long it took for these two people to hit each other? How fast are they going kind of relative to each other? Let's pretend. Actually, it seems like it's 10. They are going equal. Ever do this, like if you're, didn't they, did you ever take driver's ed class where they say, if you're going 60 miles per hour and hit another car at 60 miles per hour head on, it's like 120 miles per hour. You ever remember that? It's like they show you a horrible video of blood and stuff, right? It's, it's the same sort of thing. If this guy's going 10 and this girl's going 10, the total is 20 actually, okay, of the thing. So 20 kilometers per hour, and how far did they go? 10 kilometers. Actually, well, that's, that's true, but the total distance, okay. like if you think about 20 kilometers per hour and this guy was going 20 and she was standing still, the total distance would be 20 kilometers, right? 20 kilometers, oops, 20 kilometers, 20 kilometers per hour divided by 20 kilometers, how long did it take? One hour. One hour. How long was that poor bee flying between them? One hour. One hour. How fast was the bee going the whole time? 30 kilometers. So if the bee was going 30 kilometers per hour for an entire hour, how far, let's see, how many kilometers? 30 kilometers. Now, we didn't need any calculus for that. We didn't need any special math. We just needed to know, do we have enough information for this sort of thing, right? And I know, this was, we went through this pretty quickly. But the whole idea was, if you knew relatively how fast these people were moving, you could tell how, fa how long it took. If you knew how long it took, and you knew how far or how fast it was going, then we can say the distance equals the speed times the time 30 kilometers per hour times one hour, 30 kilometers. Okay, let's see if that's the answer. Guessing it is. 30 kilometers. So let me erase this here. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yes. Uh, um, well, you can take another math class for maybe next time for me. Um, so, yeah, so we did the exact same thing, right? We just said, look, must find the time. The time for the bikes is an hour because they're each going 10 kilometers per hour, or 10 kilometers. At, yeah, that's an actually easier way, easier way to think about it. Each one travels 10 kilometers because they hit right in the middle. So they're each going 10 kilometers at 10 kilometers per hour, meaning it takes one hour to do that. Time for the bikes is the same, so the B goes 30 kilometers like we just did. Okay? That was a tricky, that's kind of a tricky problem if you're not really thinking about this stuff, but I, I would not ask anything that tricky. On the test, I would just say, I might, again, might be a bonus, might be kind of a, you know, fun to think about sort of thing. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's see. That was speed. The one thing I didn't talk about when we talked about speed was which direction I was going. We just said, we're just going in some direction, and that's, how, that's what speed is, right? 
the direction, or it has nothing to do with speed. Velocity, on the other hand, is half speed, or half about the direction. It's the speed, so velocity is speed, but it's which direction you're going to. So if I'm going 10, 10 miles per hour this way, and I'm going 10 miles per hour this way, was my speed any different? No. Was my velocity different? It was. My velocity was 10 miles per hour this way, and then I changed direction, and now it's 10 miles per hour this way, two different directions. Or I could have walked that way, and it would have been 10 miles per hour that way. All about the direction. Okay, so if we're talking velocity, you better tell me what the direction is. By the way, we use little arrows just like we did with forces to do velocity because it shows the direction. Okay, so it's also called the vector, which we mentioned a little earlier too. Okay, <clears throat> so speed is how fast. Fair enough. Velocity is how fast with the direction. Okay, we also have some other vectors. Acceleration, which we'll talk about. Force, we already did. Momentum, which we'll get to next week, on Saturday. Okay, and that's that. All right, so that's velocity. Now, we've got to talk a little bit more about velocity. Constant speed. Constant speed means you're not, speed, you're not getting faster or going slower. Constant speed. If you're driving your car, let's say you're going around a racetrack, and the speedometer's right there at 50 miles an hour. Right? Is your speed any different around this racetrack? Is your velocity different? Yeah, it is. Why? Because you're not going in the same direction, right? So every instant you're turning, your velocity is actually changing. Okay, big concept here. Big, big concept. If you're going in a circle, can you go at constant velocity? No. You can't do it. Direction. Does your direction change when you're going in a circle? the whole time. Right? So it's impossible to change to be at a constant velocity going in a circle. And that's something people never quite like a lot it takes a long time to like really sink in. Circular motion is acceleration even if you're at the same speed. Whew, that's a big one. Okay, we'll get there. Tom. What about a vertical circle like this? What about it? I mean if When does it go straight? It goes straight at every instant, by the way. Every, like, if you just stopped yourself, stop time, couldn't you point in the direction the car's going? Whatever direction you're facing, that's the direction the car's going. But then the next instant, it's changed. Okay. Comes back to calculus, actually. You've got to have calculus to, like, really understand that stuff. But, but really, the bottom line is, if you're going in a circle, even a vertical circle, it's like you might be going this way, this way, this way, but isn't the, isn't the head of the pen changing direction? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Vertical motion is cool. The, question, well, the, the reason I said yes is because even though you're going in a circle, but the change is consistent. Absolutely. The change is consistent, which means it's actually a constant. Well, I guess it's, a, it's a, yes, the change is consistent. The change changes direction too, <laughs> but yes, it's a constant one. You're right. You're right. But it's not a constant velocity because remember, if you change direction, you can do that. Okay. So, here's the bottom line question. What three controls in your car will change your velocity? What's the easy one? Well, but what do you, what, gas pedal, right? So you're pushing on the gas pedal. You're speeding up, right? What's the other one? Brake, right? You're stepping on the brake. That's slowing you down. That's changing your velocity because you're speeding up or slowing down. What's the third one? Steering wheel, because you're turning, right? So there's the three things, okay? Well, that's a good point. Yeah, air friction, but that's not really a control. That just happens, right? Yep, absolutely. But you're not really controlling it. Like you can actually turn the wheel with your hands or push on the pedals with your feet. That's the control part of it. You're not really controlling the friction because you can't do it. But good call. So the three things. That kind of question I would ask on a test. What three things in your car? Okay. Now. This is an interesting one, and another kind of tricky one. Everything is always moving. Even when you think you're standing still, you're actually speeding through space. Like right now, we're all sitting here, right, enjoying our, you know, whatever, and we're, we feel like we're not moving, but you are. You're moving in lots of directions. The Earth is turning. You're moving about 1,000 miles an hour, 
right? Just on the surface of the Earth this way. Well, actually this way, <laughs> right? But we're also moving relative to the sun, because the sun up and down every day, right? Well, it's not really moving. I mean, it is relative to the rest of the galaxy, but it's not that they remember we're the ones going around the sun. Any ideas how fast roughly in miles per hour we're going relative to the sun? What do you think? 10, 100,000, 10,000? They do Oh, they do. You're right. Do you remember what it was? What is it? 100,000 kilometers per hour, which is about 60,000 miles per hour. 60,000 miles per hour you are moving right now. Hmm. If somebody took a, like, a bowling ball and just kind of plopped it into space near the Earth, it would smash into the Earth at 60,000 miles per hour. It can't, you can't really do that, but you know, asteroids hit the Earth, or well, comets, or meteors, meteors. There was one a few weeks ago in Russia or something. They, they see the front of it. They're big. Yeah. They're the biggest country. Yeah. They, you know, they, they, you know, they deserve it. Because they're the biggest country, not because they used to be communists. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, okay. 